All right. So we're going to go over then and we're going to start, obviously, questions and discussions. Again, we're in three books. Okay. The one that we're in every day is obviously the Bible. Okay. And I hope you guys have a good study Bible or at least good study tools, uh, because I think it is really necessary uh, to really dig in. Um, and I think nowadays you have to be careful. There's a lot of really kind of quirky study Bibles out there, but the, I love the Lutheran study. Now I, I tell people about it, um, and tell them why I, I think it's the best, but I, you know, I also tell them I am Lutheran by conviction. So, you know, uh, but I, I think it's a good one. A lot of the times when I do discussions, um, like when I taught over Revelation, it took us two and a half years to get through Revelation when I taught it in my home Bible study. Reason is, is I brought four competing commentaries. So I brought the one I believe is true. I brought then two different premillennial, classical premillennial, and you know, uh, there's two, well, there's more than two varieties. And then I also brought postmillennial. Um, and so we went through those, but I also brought in other apocalyptic books that were written at the same time or around the same time, like the books of Enoch, the books of Jasher, some of those uh, to help people get an understanding. And I think it's good uh, to do that because then, you know, iron sharpens iron. Uh, you can come to, to good interpretation or you should be able to. So number, so in regards to that, now this is the only thing we've stayed on par with, uh, you should be through Exodus 13. Uh, with the selected Bible readings that we've been doing. And again, it's just a chapter a day. So were there any questions that you had through those? No questions. Okay. It always amazes me. You know, you just, it's like the day after they get out of Egypt and already they're complaining. Oh, I know. You know? <laughs> well, and I think it's... It's interesting. One thing that I don't know a lot of people realize is every single one of the plagues was against a prominent god of Egypt. And a lot of people don't realize that. They think somewhat they're arbitrary or they're, and they're not. Uh, and that's what's kind of fascinating. I've got a diagram that I use with my fifth and sixth graders that shows them the different gods and what they were supposedly in control of that God was then showing they're nothing in my sight. Your gods are idols. Yes? Weren't those plagues all new? Like the flies, the frogs? I, I don't know if they were. They, they, I would assume they'd had plagues of locusts before just because of the nature of locusts, the fall. Um, so I would never want to say that they were the first. I would definitely say they were first predicted because Moses would tell them, yeah. you know, something was going to happen. So it, it had a different character, similar to the rainbow. There's a debate, and I wouldn't hang my hat that there were no rainbows before the flood. There probably were rainbows because we had moisture in the air and we had sun refract, refracting that light. But what God did is God brought something that was visible and he repurposed it for a sign similar to what Christ does the night of the Last Supper. Yeah. He repurposes the Passover to be all about him and to focus more primarily on him. Yeah, Dean. I think Mount Sinai is fenced off now. Well, there's a debate on which one it is. There's many that support the traditional Mount Sinai in, um, you know, uh, where St. Catherine's is. But there are many that have moved over to uh, Jabal al laz is what it's called. It's in Saudi Arabia. And uh, many have called it the Mountain of Moses. Uh, there have been some people in there that have gone in secretively. The video that they did has great information, but it's really corny, um, <laughs> unfortunately. And I don't think you can get in there regularly. Uh, the gentleman that I've seen that has done the most research on it is a gentleman by the name of Bob Cornuke. Uh, who was a, he was a detective in LA, and then he, he actually partnered with a Swedish DNA scientist, uh, and they've done some research over there. Great information, they've written a book, uh, and many have bought on, because we have things where Paul in Galatians talks about Mount Sinai in Arabia, 
and the Sinai Peninsula would not been considered at the time of Paul in Arabia. Uh, there's other things that are brought in. So it is debated, yes. Uh, in my opinion, from what I've read, uh, I, I, I do believe that the case for the one in Saudi Arabia, Jabal al I, I think has a much stronger standing. Yeah. Yes. Um, in Exodus, the you know the blood on the uh -huh, the door frame, the lintel frame. Uh huh. It's um, theory that you know because Jews were naturally rebellious. That some like of all didn't. humans. <laughs> yeah. That some of them didn't even do that. Mm -hmm. And of course, they perished. Yeah, if they didn't put it over their doors, they would have perished. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and I'm not sure how many, I don't know of a biblical, but uh, I'm, I'm sure there were probably some who maybe looking at, you know, just the tendencies of humans and also look at the Sadducees and the, Her uh, the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. They wanted Jesus dead because the Sadducees didn't want to lose their position. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I'm, wouldn't be surprised uh, if there were many who did not do. Uh, they were like, dude, this Moses guy's a crackpot, and if I do this, then it's almost like I'm marking my door, and the Egyptians are going to know that, that I was, you know, going to the other side, and they may come and kill me. I mean, there could have been thoughts like that. Uh, who knows? Well, not, all, not everyone is faithful. Oh, no. No. Not at all. Um, and I, you know, I think... To a certain degree, uh, we see the progression because God had shown himself faithful nine times. Mm -hmm. And I, I like the analogy that uh, faith, for, and, and analogies only go so far, but faith or obstinance is like butter and clay. Heat is applied to both, but heat applied to butter softens it. Heat applied to mud hardens it. Mm -hmm. And so it takes in the nature, the same force is acting upon it. Uh, and so either, like in Pharaoh's case, their hearts were hardened, or in the case uh, of many, their hearts were softened. Uh, and those who were softened, I mean, after nine miracles, if you're still rebellious and you didn't obey by the 10th, I think God gave you a pretty good faithfulness to, you're going with your will, not your reason in that, in your trust. I would say. Okay, any other questions on that, those biblical passages? No? Okay, all right. So we will move on to, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, okay? Uh, and this one I think is a very important chapter because this really takes us, it's almost like a bridge that takes us from the rationale and the reasoning that we've been doing both scientifically philosophically, you know, and just rationally to get to the point. Because if you look at it, we have not used the Bible to make any of our points, and we're going to get to that. But chapter 8, signs of God or gullibility. Are we just the unwise, as David Hume would call us? Uh, because only wise men follow regular occurrences, and so no wise man would ever believe in miracles. One of the arguments. But I love it. If we admit God must we admit miracle? Indeed, indeed, you have no security against it. That is the bargain. Really, it all comes down to God. It really comes down to whether or not he exists. And really, what we have found out that through this, we need to pause for a second and see where we are. Now, remember, I've told you that the whole book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, is a step-by-step -step progression from pure skepticism the way to an intellectual assent. Uh, now, intellectual assent does not necessarily mean faith. We hear James say that the demons believe and tremble, but it's not a salvific faith. Uh, they can't be saved anyways, but you get my point. Um, it is an intellectual assent, okay? So, because we're also gonna come to that, and we had discussed it earlier, why then do some people don't believe if all the evidence is there? Because there are three types of doubt or rebellion. There's volitional means we don't want God to be there. One is emotional, uh, you know, 
either we've seen too much pain, we're, we're, that there's nothing that we feel can justify the pain in the world, or intellectual, you have questions that haven't been answered and hopefully we can answer. So there's many ways of doubting and just because you can intellectually concede doesn't mean that they're gonna to wanna to go with it for lack of a better term, okay? But we need to pause for a moment and put together the pieces of the puzzle we've discovered so far, okay? From the lines of evidence that we've already gone over, and again, these are secular arguments. These are not religiously based. Cosmological, teleological, and moral arguments. We are able to know beyond a reasonable doubt that a theistic God exists who has certain characteristics, okay? So when we think about this, and we're not going to go back over these arguments, but I think they are powerful arguments. And again, they're more than just these. And I think it's a cumulative case, very similar to a puzzle. As you put the pieces of the puzzle together, the more and more that fit together properly, the better understanding. If you're having pieces that aren't fitting and they're all awkward and their you know, dimensions are all off, you have something to miss. Uh, but I think that what we see is we cumulatively grow in this. All of it supports what we believe biblically. Okay, so let's ask this question. From the cosmological argument, what do we know about God? What are some attributes or characteristics of God that we know from the cosmological argument? Okay, think of what the cosmological argument is. Okay. In the beginning, you know, we can think about Genesis, but anything that begins to exist that has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. So the universe is not that eternal thing. So something had to bring that into existence. Okay? What are some of those characteristics to create a universe? Eternal. Okay? So eternal in the sense of... Okay, so outside of time, okay? Because time comes into existence. Remember our SURGE acronym? SURGE is, you know, second law of thermodynamics, the expanding of the universe, uh, all the different things. The last one was Einstein's theory of relativity, which shows that time, matter, space, and energy are co-determinative, meaning that they came into existence at the same time. All of them had a beginning. So as he said, this being who brought the universe into existence has to be outside of time, timeless, eternal. What are other characteristics? Intelligence. Intelligence. We're going to find this in the next one as well because we see the fine-tuning of the universe. Okay? This universe is a very big place. Think of the stars. Betelgeuse, it's not even the largest star. If it is where our sun was right now, we would be in the star. <laughs> Think of the power. And that's just one star. Mm -hmm. You know, and you guys saw Brian's uh, talk on astronomy. So he has to be what? Powerful. Infinitely powerful. He has to be almost unlimited. He also, if there was one time there was nothing and now there's something, what had to take place for there to be something? Creation is an act of will. So we have volition. So in the first cause, so just from the cosmological argument, if we use the scientific idea of cause and effect relationship, you have to have something super powerful. Outside of time has to be immaterial because matter came into existence. Ultimately intelligent. They have to have a personhood because only persons will create something to bring it. So you see we're starting to get all these different attributes of God that confirm what we believe in scripture, don't contradict it, okay? Uh, and it's all from non-religious means. Now, many people will come up and say, well, it's a religious motivation. Well, fine, that's a religious motivation because we believe the Bible is true, but R is the evidence that we're presenting. Has it have anything to do with the Bible? No, it doesn't. You know? So, from the teleological argument, we know that God is, and, and you know, Randy telling us that extremely intelligent because the design we see in biologic life is phenomenal. The design we see in 
the the laws and the the status of you know if you want to say 100 plus uh, variables that if any of them are tweaked a little bit life doesn't exist now we wouldn't agree with a lot of those but a lot of them we would from a young earth perspective so ultra intelligent he loves beauty look at all the colors look at all the variation he loves I, I think of Jonah, and this is, you know, where, you know, Jonah is wanting the city destroyed, and God says, think about the people that don't know their right from their left and the many cattle. He, you know, we hear about, you know, not a sparrow falls to the ground. But we have beauty, we have music, we have creativity. These are all things that we see within this design. So we're getting really good aspects of who this creator is. The moral argument, what do we know about God from the moral argument or the creator or the one who has brought this universe into existence? What, are, what, what do we know from the moral argument? Subjective. That subjective, that in the sense, explain that a little more. That, um, He's dealing with subjects. There, there are some things that mm -hmm. are always morally good. And so objective. Objective. Yes. Objective, meaning that they have uh, in and of themselves outside of our mind actuality. And that justice comes from God. Okay? So we have a God that is concerned with righteousness, justness. But he also wants reconciliation. I think you can bring that from the moral argument. Mm -hmm. Recompense. There, you can delve into these things and I think it's interesting. Sometimes with my students, I'll have them do a timed competition and we'll go through these arguments and I'll say, okay, now get in your group, give me every characteristic you can think of that comes from this argument that we could see as a character or an attribute of God. And you can really delve in deep. It's really good. Okay, so this is where we are. Theism is the proper term to describe such a God. What we're seeing from all these arguments is that theism is the only thing that stands. We have a God who is intelligent. We have a God who is willful. We have a God who has a moral basis. We have a God who loves beauty. We have a God who loves righteousness. This is, again, coming from cause and effect relationships. We have a God who has personality. Okay, things of that nature. Yeah. On the previous, um, the moral argument. Yeah. <clears throat> you could add wrath. Yeah. He punishes evil. Moral, yeah, with morality. Yeah, and I think a lot of the times people get that confused. They'll try to make God a single characteristic. You hear it all the time, God is love. Yes, God is love, but he is also just <laughs> and must punish those things that violate that justness, which is all of us, all the time. Um, that's why Christ is needed, but yes, okay? Now here is the amazing truth about these findings. The theistic God we have discovered, as we've talked about, has been discovered using rational, scientific, philosophical means. We have not employed the Bible in any of our arguments. It is confirming what we believe, Okay, so theologians call revelation of God natural or general revelation. This is what we see in Romans 1 and 2. Okay, and that's clearly seen independent of any type of scripture. So now again, as we go along these lines, we're going to find out that the opposite of true is false. So if it doesn't abide by these things that we've come by in regards to a first cause, then we have some problems. Okay, that's why we have major problems with life coming from non-life with all these different things. And really, if they discover life in the lab through the laboratory and through all the test tubes, then they will just have proven that intelligent design was required to create life in the laboratory because that's what they were doing, okay? Even with the Miller-Urey experiment and all the problems with it, he was moving things around. He was intelligently contriving ways to do things that didn't happen naturally. Okay? So, 
Revelation of Scripture, I think we all know this, is called special revelation. And the most important things, really from general revelation, that's why I always get confused about those who want to say, let's go, you know, let's go worship Mother Nature. Mother Nature is a wrathful, cruel, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah, if you want to do that, then really what the Druids did with a lot of the darker Hinduistic people like Kali and that, that's what you get. We get the grace, the love from special revelation and understanding in that sense, okay? So the discovery helps us see not only what the true box top looks like, anybody who tries that puzzle should be shot, no. It's double-sided Dalmatians. Mm. That's all it is. I want to try it. Oh gosh, I would, I, it would drive me insane. I'd rather learn a language or something than do a puzzle that would take me. Yes, I guess you could have good conversation while you're doing it. <laughs> I'd be too focused. Oh, it'd waste, it. yeah, okay. Uh, but what it cannot look like. So if we have come up, and again, if we have found that this is a theistic universe, then anything that is non-theistic is the opposite of true, okay? This is where these principles at the very beginning come in. We could even say it as simple as this. If this is our box top of the world, we have a black and white world. Anything that claimed that color was inherent would be what? False, okay? Now again, I'm analogizing, putting it in a smaller, so, but, so when we think about it, atheism then is false, okay? Now, we're, we're giving a high level overview. These principles are true and correct. The details, when you start arguing, can be more complicated. We see that, we, we know the difference. But I'm giving you the overview that as you study, you will find, because the opposite of true is false, that if there is a personal God that's required for the world as we know it, then any religion that claims that no personal, willful, intelligent creator exists, they contradict, okay? One of them has to be false. At least one of them has to be false. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times what I try to show people too, there's a great series too, it's called Destroying All Speculation. It's done by a guy where I don't totally, his name is uh, Greg Bonson. I don't agree with all of his methods. He is called what is called a presuppositional apologist, but he basically goes through, and it's a lot of lectures, it's about 10 hours of lectures, but he goes and he shows that you can break worldviews into certain categories, similar to what we're doing now. And you can look at the characteristics in the world from arguments like this, and we can show in the category, so you can put, say, the Eastern religions, many forms of Buddhism, Hinduism, that. You can group them all together, and because they have certain things, namely uh, problems with, well, they got problems with morality, they got problems with the beginning, but anyways, with those problems, it shows that they are false. So you don't have to go in and learn every aspect of Hinduism. You can look at its core beliefs and see whether or not those break down with the arguments that we've used. And if those break down, yeah, all the ancillary stuff, it's, it falls, it's a house of cards. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So, when we look at it, why does the existence of a theistic God disprove polytheism? He goes into it briefly, and it's somewhat of a philosophical argument. And it gets, it really hangs on one word. Not creation, not chaos, the word is infinite. Because what we find out with the word infinite, infinite means without bound. If you have two infinites, you have a contradiction. They're no longer unbounded. And so it gets into more of the argument to show, this is something you guys may want to dig into a little more. Um, but basically when it comes to polytheism, we just need to look that there are inherent things that cause it to break down. Now, they may say that these aren't then ultimate gods. These are like Greek gods, or these are like spirits that we have, uh, like demons and angels, which we believe in Christianity. 
The problem then comes into creation. Well, who is the ultimate cause? Who is the ultimate beginning? Where did this arrive? You can't have an eternal uh, uh, regression. Okay? Now, I know this may get a little mind-numbing, but it is. So polytheism, but it's something to look into. Maybe look at some things online. Uh, I can try to give you some resources as well. But it's an area. So really, polytheism, atheism, panentheism, pretty much everything other than theism, the qualifications now have fallen because of what we have seen to be true about the universe through the arguments that we've used. Okay? The fine-tuning uh, of both biologic life and of the universe, the cosmological argument, the moral argument, if those things are all true to reality, as I think they self-evidently are, but also can be argued, this is a theistic world and anything that opposes theism core is false. Now, um, we need to remember God has already communicated to us through creation and conscience, natural and general, or natural or general revelation, which gives us basic ideas about his existence, power, and moral requirements. But we're still a far away from proving the Bible, correct? Because now we have Judaism, we have Islam, we have some forms of, of other faiths, uh, but primarily it's the Abrahamic faiths that you look at, okay? So why doesn't God just appear to each one of us? Do you remember what C.S. Lewis said? Whether you agree with him or disagree with him, I think it's a, it's a pertinent point. Because we see the fear in the Old Testament when God descends. Does anybody remember? Well, we can, no one can see God and live. Okay. okay. Biblically, we're, we're talking more, and that's very, but if we think about what does, and according to Lewis, and, and you may have disagreements within Christianity, but I think it's something that you can consider, is that God has allowed us the ability to reject him. Mm -hmm. To reject something requires free will. Mm -hmm. Lewis's idea is that free will is not, um, cannot withstand the full frontal assault of God, for lack of a better term. Uh, C.S. Lewis in his screw tape letters said, God cannot, uh, oh, what did he say? God cannot, uh, um, he can only woo, and I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, I can read he says, he cannot ravish, he can only yeah. woo, is at the end, which basically encapsulates what he's going to say. So he says basically only the very minuteness of the revelation of God still allows for that ability to reject, or else the free will of the creature is overridden. Whether you agree with that or not, we can look at places in Scripture where God appeared to people, uh, you know, Christ, obviously, in his human form, there would be other kind of details with that, but Paul on the road to Damascus. Uh, but was it still? You know, he could reject a vision. He didn't have to believe that he could have believed he was hallucinating, all these things, okay? The so, of the Lord. huh? Yep, with a lot of the appearances of the angel of the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most part, it, it was Jesus. Pre-incarnate Jesus. Yeah. Yep. Yep, but I think what Lewis is talking more about the glory of God, that thing that is the only thing that some people say will convince them, would not allow free will. Well, if um, it happened to everybody too, then it would be so commonplace that people wouldn't be But think about this as well. The angels were from their creation in the presence of God, and they rebelled. So, so there are other aspects, again. There are volitional aspects as created being made in the image of God. So really, God is making it, and we're going to move on, but God is making it so that it is persuasive enough for anybody willing to look, but is also rejectable if you want nothing to do with it. It could have appeared to the Californians with all those burning bushes. <laughs> The forest fires, God was speaking to you, the whole state. No. Yeah, Dave. I'm thinking if God appeared to me mm -hmm. and I really knew it was him, 
I would have to be either insane or totally evil to volitionally reject him. You would almost lose self-will. Yeah. 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 And that's what, that's what his uh, comment is. Did someone come in? Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so that would cause uh, that rejection of free will. So in fact, the Bible says God is not always as vert as we would like him to be. Luther and other traditions work with this. They call it the hiddenness of God, especially in our most painful moments. Uh, there is a book. It was written by the same guy who did Lex Rex, Sam uh, Rutherford. He was a Puritan divine. He also wrote a book called the I think it's called The Beauty of Christ or The Loveliness of Christ. And in it, he has a letter to a woman who has just lost her child. And it's those moments where he says, you know, you feel God farthest from you. But that's when you rely on who God is, his character. You know who he is. That's where I think a lot of the times that faith, he's not always as overt as we would like him to be. And when we think about it, uh-oh, my clicker has gone clickless. Here we go. Yeah, I did. Oh, because of the, got it, got it. Went off on. That's what happened. There we go. Okay, cool. So, um, how are we supposed to tell whose book, if any, is really a message from God? So we've built up this point. We've given all these arguments to basically say it is a theistic universe. Now we've broken it down to those religions that are theistic at their core. A one God, now whether it's a trinity or a unity, you know, that we don't know yet. But we have now come. So how do we know? And again, remember I said the miracles are really the bridge. Because we have general revelation, but what religion mostly is, is special revelation. It's combined with natural. So now we have competitors. We have competing religions that have the same basis from the natural arguments or the secular arguments that we've brought forth that all coincide with this. All of them are confirmed by this. So now we need to make sure that we find which one is telling us the truth. Because what we find out is that Islam has a different Jesus than Christianity does. So does uh, uh, Judaism, okay? <laughs> different ideas of God, whether he's, ma uh, uh, he's a unity and totally other, or if he's Trinity. We have things that can't be true because of the law of non-contradiction, okay? So this is where we start getting into the miracles. Uh-oh. Okay, so what is a miracle? I really like, and this comes from an atheist. Now, he actually wrote a book, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Became a Deist, or, um, that's not the title, I'm sorry. Anthony Flew is the one who wrote it. Is there something... PowerPoint isn't shared anymore. Yeah. Well, you might be offline again. <laughs> Shoot. Okay. Well, I'll keep going. Anthony Flew. Uh, and he actually is the one who came up with this. This comes from the Encyclopedia of Philosophy when it's on miracles. It says, a miracle is something which would never have happened had nature, as it were, been left to its own devices. So basically, a miracle is something that nature cannot do. And we're actually going to look at different aspects. Um, can I move on? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Except I think you took me off. There you go. Yep. Just click on the screen. Yep. There we go. So... If God actually works in this way, then a miracle confirms, and this is what he really points to. If God actually works in this way, then a miracle confirms the message and the sign confirms the sermon. Or he goes on, put it another way, a miracle is an act of God to confirm the word of God through a messenger of God. So what we have is a miracle. A miracle is a stamp of approval, similar to like a king's signet ring. Something that is unique, 
only doable and very distinguishable for an individual to mark it off. Uh, and so this is kind of the seal of approval. A miracle is that. Okay? So can a God who created the entire universe out of nothing part the Red Sea? Of course, yes, self-explanatory, okay? So really the biggest miracle of all, the creation of the universe makes everything else parlor tricks. Now I'm not demeaning God's miracles, I'm trying to put it in perspective. It is nothing that is that difficult if you can create everything that we know around us out of nothing. The power, the intelligence, and everything that goes along that line. Now we see that science confirms a universe, they say, from nothing. Uh, when we look at the arguments with the Big Bang, okay? So when we go on, now this doesn't mean that God has performed the biblical miracles. We have not proven the Bible's miracles are true. We are just coinciding with the Bible to say, if this is a theistic universe and it's a package deal, as Lewis says, miracles are part of the deal. Now, what is the purpose of miracles? Are you still having it's not showing one of the screens? Yes. Yep, it's there now. Okay, so cool. I was trying. It was okay, well. cool. So, <laughs> all it's saying is that the biblical account that miracles happened is rational and reasonable in a theistic universe, which I believe that we've got at least the underbasis to make the reasonable argument that people should be able to look at our opinion. Okay? <laughs> So, since the late 1600s, two major objections that we're going to look at really quick. First, natural laws are immutable. The argument that natural laws are immutable comes from Spinoza. Okay, he was about 100 years before, so he was in the mid-1600s. Okay, and he basically, he was a pantheist. Uh, he was a Jewish pantheist, and he already was at the point, and we see some uh, circular reasoning, both him and Hume, uh, in regards to this, okay? So it says most people, from my understanding, and he states it in the book as well, I don't think many people believe this anymore because it's really simply refutable. <laughs> it very easily refutable. All you have to do is do something like this. Because I am imposing my will over the immutable law of gravity. Mm -hmm. Because if gravity is unchangeable and un mutable or immutable, meaning you can't violate it, case in point, I have. And if we can do things like this, how much more can a God who created the universe act within the universe he has created? So miracles really are not that spectacular from a godly standpoint, uh, just as the works that things that we can do and create uh, in our uh, position. Okay. Coffee bean? I think it's one of God's greatest <laughs> gifts. <laughs> it's up there with border collies. Uh, border collies and uh, coffee. You know, wine's up there too. <laughs> yeah, but so it goes. It says miracles are violations. This is kind of putting in a nutshell what Spinoza believed. Miracles are violations of natural laws. Natural laws are immutable. It is impossible to violate immutable laws. Therefore, miracles are impossible. But isn't the question of the immutability of natural laws what we're trying to ascertain in the first place? He has it as one of his premises. This is a technical definition of circular reasoning, where you smuggle in your conclusion in your premises. Okay? So yeah, if we automatically say natural laws are immutable, then yeah, miracles are impossible. But that's the question at hand. So the problem with this is that it begs the question. If you define natural laws as immutable, then of course miracles are impossible. But that's the very question. Okay? Creation itself demonstrates that natural laws are immutable. Something doesn't naturally come from nothing. But here we are. Even if you take a scientific view, you just have to look at the Big Bang and say they are not. And it's interesting because really it breaks down. They don't even know what the natural laws, I mean, really all the laws break down in that point. So they, they only apply to us. Yeah, I that only applies to Christians and miracles, <laughs> <laughs> at least in this point. We also know that natural laws are not immutable because they are descriptions of what happens, not prescriptions. Now, 
Usually we can use those forces, like sending a rocket to the moon. We use those forces because we know how things regularly act, that we can harness that information, that knowledge, that power, and curb it to our will to send satellites. But we can also throw in a wrench, if you want to call it, and screw up the whole process. So there are other things, there are descriptions of general occurrences, but they are not prescriptive. They do not determine fatalistically what or will not happen. Agents can change that, as we see. Once you introduce intelligent beings into the picture, natural forces can be overpowered. We know that those forces can be overpowered because, like I did with my beautiful coffee cup, oh, I love coffee. <laughs> <laughs> we do it ourselves every day. The second one, so that one's really easy to refute. The second one that's more today is miracles are not credible. And this actually still works today because we are in a cancel culture. And so you can already see when we get to Hume's argument, he starts using ad hominem arguments. The wise man never does this. The wise man only does this. So if you disagree with him, what are you? Not wise. Not wise. So you already see kind of the poisoning of the water in his argument. So the argument against miracles that accepted today was put forth by David Hume, uh, died the year of our independence, about a century after Spinoza. This is basically him, his argument in a syllogism. Natural laws by definition, a description of a regular occurrence. Okay, here we have even in his argument showing against Spinoza that it's not prescriptive, but descriptive. Okay, so natural law is by definition a description of regular occurrence. Miracle is by definition a rare occurrence. The evidence for the regular is always greater than that for the rare. A wise man always bases his belief on the greater evidence. Therefore, a wise man should never believe in miracles. Now, if you really want to dig into this argument, a secular writer wrote a book. Uh, oh gosh, what is it called? The Abysmal Failure of Hume? or the, I mean, it's, he's a philosophy professor. I'll get you the title if you need it. But it, it, it's like the abysmal failure of Hume. And he goes through for like 100 pages and philosophically just tears Hume's argument apart, saying this thing has, shouldn't have lasted outside the lifetime of Hume, uh, which there were people that refuted it at that time. But again, it seems like maybe there's more of a case of we want this argument against miracles to be true. Not necessarily we have the intellectual capital to show that it is, okay? Um, so if these four premises are true, then the conclusion necessarily follows. The wise man should never, okay? But which one should we pick at? Do you guys remember which one that the authors pick at? I'd pick at number two to begin with. Two? Yes? And, and you could say, you know, obviously it is a rare occurrence. Um, I don't think so. Well, it is in the sense of normal activity. If we did a comparison of things falling to the ground or things on their own levitating. So we could say it's more common. How about life? We you could. Life every day. I believe life is a miracle. I would say first life was a miracle. I think everything after that God put in the mechanism to do it so it's no longer a miracle, it's a natural occurrence. So there would be some, but we're going to get into that in a second. Um, so when he says, unfortunately for Hume and those over the years who have believed him, has a false premise. Premise number three. So if we look at three really quick, the evidence for the regular is always greater than that for the rare. And we're going to show this in three naturalistic, and he does three naturalistic ways. To disprove premise three, we only need to come up with one counterexample. Okay, so if somebody makes a premise that you can show just one counterexample for, it disproves or it shows the, f uh, the, um, uh, the, the issue with that premise. Okay, that that premise needs to be looked at again, reevaluated, okay, because it falsifies it. And if you falsify it, then you can't get to the conclusion. So to, to disprove, we actually have several from Hume's own view. One, origin of the universe only happened once. And it's a forensic. We can't recreate anything like it in the lab. It is a one-time event that we have no idea how it took place, according to uh, natural science. Okay? We know 
how it did. Well, we're still expanding. And there are certain things, life is still being reproduced. You know, life making other life uh, after its own kind. Number two, origin of life happened only once. Now, there are some places, and I've heard, except I haven't heard it too much, that there was, uh, that it happened more than once. They tried to do that similar to similar traits because of new tendencies in evolutionary theory with what are called cladistics. We won't get into it, but they believe flight actually evolved multiple times in different areas uh, because they no longer have that lineage, which I think makes it even more remotely impossible. Um, but I would say most, because they still call it the last universal common ancestor. So I still believe most believe that it only happened once. Okay, the origin of new life forms has only happened once. So when the monkey came on the scene or when, according to evolutionary theory, uh, when the ape came on the scene, when the snail came on the scene, all of these, it happened only once. Okay, now they'll try to say that everything is a transitional form. I think there's problems with that argument, but so we see all again, we just need one and we have three from his own worldview that are non-negotiable, rare, but the evidence is overwhelming, okay? In fact, the entire history of the world is comprised of rare, unrepeatable events. David's, Hume's own birth. So you guys, if we rationally look at this and we take his argument, we can't trust anything in history, okay? Because a wise man would not believe. What is he missing on all this? evidential argumentation. He's overgeneralizing, he's blanket stating, and running. So first, it confuses believability with possibility. He's actually not even arguing whether it's possible or not. He's arguing whether or not you should believe it. Well, whether you believe something or not doesn't make it true. Look at the geocentrism that we had for so long. Everyone believed it, but it wasn't true doesn't matter what you believe. So really, this, you know, believability, okay, so maybe some people don't believe it or don't, but it doesn't impede on whether it's true or not, whether it is possible or not. There's something wrong with an argument that tells you to disbelieve what you have verified to be true. What he's talking about is he said, if someone was in the tomb, and you can come up with different things. There's great books on miracles. Craig Keener has wrote two volumes that are amazing of modern miracles uh, that you can go through. But what he was saying is, think of someone who was in the tomb, saw Jesus rise from the dead, saw the angels. If he would use Hume's argument or she would use Hume's argument, she would not believe what she saw. She could not. She would be unwise because it was a rare occurrence. Okay. But again, what's the evidence that supports it? Okay, second, Hume confuses probability with evidence. Rarity and more common is just probability. Probability has nothing to do with the evidential basis of why we believe something. Okay, so the issue is not whether an event is regular or rare. The issue is whether we have good evidence for the event. We must weigh evidence for the event in question, not add evidence for all the previous events. Now, I wish I... And, and I know that uh, Kathy's following along. I don't have page numbers. I usually have the kids get Kindle books because that's Kindle location for all the different arguments. So it helps them to go through if they want to look at a location, okay? So third, Hume is actually arguing in a circle. Instead of evaluating the veracity of the evidence for each individual claim, and a lot of people will come up to you and say, well, and they're almost to a similar blanket statement. They say, well, Mormons talk about miracles and you talk about miracles, so it disproves both. Uh, no. You need to take the individual cases for those miracles and see which one actually holds water, okay? Or in a larger scale. Okay, so uh, in advance because he believes there is uniform evidence against it. Okay, so he doesn't believe it because he doesn't believe it. This is what C.S. Lewis responded to him. And again, it's in your book. 
Now, of course, we must agree with Hume that if there is absolutely human or uniform experience against miracles, if in other words, they have never happened, why then they never have. Unfortunately, we know the experience against them to be uniform only if we know that all the reports of them are false. There's tons of reports. We have biblical, we have uh, modern responses, we have them through the centuries. So the only way that you can say it's a uniform experience, meaning all agree, you are necessarily stating that they all have to be false and you know they're all false. That's the only way you can get to that. And he says, uh, experience against them to be uniform only if we know that all the reports of them are false. And we can know all the reports to be false only if we know already that miracles have never occurred. In fact, we are arguing in a circle. C.S. Lewis is, is such a great, okay? So the only way to know for sure is to investigate. What's the evidence? And that's a, that's a quip that AOI has been saying for year after year after year. When you're given a picture or you've shown something in a museum, What's the evidence? Oh, great. This is a great reconstruction. What is it based on? How did you come to that conclusion? Remember when we think about the Columbo tactic that we're talking about, how did you come to that conclusion? What brought you to that reasoning? Those are the questions we need to ask. People spew these things out all the time. Christians spew things out about Christianity all the time. And if I was a good atheist again, I would say, well, why do you believe that? And unfortunately, most Christians don't know. Okay. Um, finally, although Hume correctly defines a miracle as a rare event, he punishes it for being a rare event. So basically he says, if it were more common, then I'd believe it. But then if it's more common, then it's not a miracle. It's just a common event. And so to really say this makes his idea unfalsifiable in a sense. So if we can't believe in rare events, then we can't believe anything from history, history, is replete with them. This is unreasonable. You cannot live. Kind of gets into our uh, fallacy, or not fallacy, but our suicide that we're going to talk about today. Once you try to act upon this, it makes all history unknowable. But we know history is knowable. Okay? So, but since we know that God exists, miracles are possible. Any argument against miracles that can be concocted, including David Hume's, is destroyed by the one fact. Because if God exists, miracles are possible. Okay? So, so the box is open. Miracles are possible. But how will we know a miracle if we see one? We're going to stop there and take a break. Okay? I know. A cliffhanger. I know. I'm going to leave you there. So we'll just take a couple of minute break. And, and I'm sorry, Pam, we're eating delectables brought by, uh, you know, and I'm sure you have some great stuff at the house. Kathy brought it. Yeah, Kathy and Dean. Did you say Anthony yeah. who was atheist and he became a believer? He, not a believer. He became a deist. He actually was in conversation with uh, a... Uh, Christian uh, by the name of Gary Habermas, and he actually debated him quite a bit, and they, they developed a friendship. And so Anthony Flew uh, wrote a book, How the Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind, is what it was called. He became a deist, uh, as far as we know. And he basically said that his pursuit of the divine was one of reason. And the argument that really sold him was the teleological the design in life. He said there has to be. There just has to be. Now it's interesting. When that book came out and I had seen a couple of reviews of it and I watched some blogs on it, I actually went and I got the New York Times uh, book review of it. I got a couple of uh, vloggers that reviewed it. Not a single one dealt with the arguments. Usually what they did is they said, oh, he's getting old and senile. He's, it, it was his ghost writer, and it's really his ideas, and he's taken advantage of Hume. Hume, or not Hume, but a, a flu. None of them really dealt with the teleological argument. They, they said that uh, he had just been uh, you know, uh, in conversation with certain Christians, and so uh, because of his feebleness of mind and all this, it was really kind of uh, dehumanizing. So, all right, yes. Thinking about Hume and probability, yeah. Um, can can we say that a 
a concept that is demonstrably, computationally, or statistically impossible as, as very highly unlikely. Impossible. Is disbelievable. I would say so. Um, and I even think, uh, and I can't remember what it was, and I think it's, it may be, you know, like 10 to the 80th, which is supposedly the number of possible, you know, molecules in the, or, or atoms in the universe or whatever, um, that they even concede that something with a probability that high is essentially impossible. Now, they may state that, but again, they try to bring in time and everything, and they'll argue that with enough time, the improbable becomes probable, the probable becomes possible, and the possible becomes certain, kind of. I agree with you. I think you, we, I, I'm sorry, you know, if you had as many chances as atoms in the universe to get one simple thing like that, it, 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 it's undoable. And I think most of them in their mind know that, mm -hmm. or at least the ones. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Is when we get into the highly technical, especially when we're arguing with, say, somebody um, of, of a different persuasion, I would put that under the category of providence, not a miracle. And, and we'll get into that here, mm -hmm. primarily because I think we need strict, almost reducing characteristics so that when one really happens, so we may err on the side yeah. of not calling something that is a miracle a miracle, then err on the side of calling everything a miracle when it's not. Because then what happens is then it weakens the force of those truly miraculous things that point to God. But was God um, acting in that? Probably. You, you if you reenacted it a hundred times, oh yeah, the person, well, let's say it was a crash test, done, mm -hmm. would be crushed. Yep. Here, that. But anyway, I was using it as a miracle to tell my brother about Jesus, and God right, and, and his, you know, divine. Yeah, I think more in that case, and I don't know the, I would more in that case you may want to say, look how close you were to death. Yeah. What happens when you die? Yeah. You know, whatever happens is going to happen. The only reason I say that is because I think they can wiggle out and say, yeah, it was improbable. Mm -hmm. But nothing supernatural happened. Not that we know of. Right. So we'll get into that. So why don't we look at this? But how will we know a miracle if we see one? Okay, and he really gets into this. I like, now you could argue, and I think it'd be a good discussion to have some time to look through these different characteristics. Now, he's going back to those arguments again. He said, let's go back to the original arguments that we came forth when we tried to determine what kind of a universe this is. So when we look at the cosmological argument, when we look at the teleological, when we look at the moral argument, when we look at these strong arguments for the existence of God, what kind of characteristics did it give us about that first cause? Now, those characteristics then are only, to a certain extent, attributed to God. Now, we as his creatures share in certain things, and we'll get more into that. But what is a miracle? So this is what he says. An act of God to be an unmistakable sign from God, the act would have to meet certain criteria, criteria that would distinguish it from something else. Because obviously, if you have something that multiple characters in the drama can do, both the villain and the good guy, there's going to be a lot of confusion and mayhem. But if there is a God and he is infinite in power and wisdom, which as we look at these different arguments, there's a reasonable case, a strong reasonable case for that, then he will be able to do things only he can do. And he will want to communicate those things because he is a morally good, just, loving God. Okay, uh, And so there are certain things that we take on, you know, uh, I don't want to say assumption, but we can reason through. Uh, with these arguments. Did you have a question, Kathy? No. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Could not we say that God chose to have 
this person live? Yes, we're going to get to that. Give me a couple of minutes because really what we want to do is in that case, any time anomalies come up or what we would call, you know, prob you know the uh, uh, providence of God, you can't surely see that it was absolutely God. Could it have happened that way, naturally? Could the laws of physics... Did any law of physics get denied in that accident with his brother? No. So really, nothing supernatural had to take place. Was it rare? Was it? Yes. Okay. But it doesn't have indistinguishable marks that only God can do. Are you following me? I think so. Okay. So that's where we want to bring in the argument. Therefore, it seems reasonable to assume that his acts would display certain elements or contain elements that would be just him. So if we look at the arguments. So he goes in and he says, an instantaneous beginning of a powerful act is evidenced by the cosmological. So he's saying it has got to be something supernatural. When he talks about power, when he talks about instantaneous beginning, he's not saying, you know, uh, that the, the force of the car. Now, if that same car would have flipped over and hung in air for his brother to climb out before it came down, that is an instantaneous, powerful act that nature could not accomplish. Now, could a demon do that? Possibly. Possibly. So that's why you have to incorporate multiple things. Um, intelligent design and purpose as evidenced by the teleological. What is the purpose? God does not do arbitrary, use a term I used earlier, parlor tricks. He doesn't do things for entertainment. Miracles, John's favorite word for miracle in his gospel is a sign. Signs point, they direct, okay? They help us to see. So the precise design for the universe, okay? When we think about the teleological argument. So what is the design? What is the purpose of that miracle, okay? Does it glorify God? Okay, then the promotion of good and right behavior as evidenced by the moral argument. If it causes you to serve or to leave Christ, is that Christ doing that? No, it is not. Now, if you're with somebody and you're arguing arguments, you know, uh, we may not be able to say moving away from Christ, but maybe it's telling you to go out like the son of Sam and kill people. You know, is murder in that aspect? Then you may get into the idea about genocidal God. But you get my point, right? That there is going to be a good moral founding for it or the reason why. Sometimes that moral founding is punishment. Um, okay? So with these criteria, <laughs> instantaneous power, something that does not happen, cannot happen, would not happen naturally. Intelligent design, there is a purpose behind it. There is a reason behind it, okay? And morality, we can identify what unusual events are true signs from God. Okay, so he uses these. So, for example, a miracle has occurred if Jesus, a man who predicted he would rise from the dead, actually rose from the dead. First, there's a purpose. What is the purpose of Jesus telling people he's going to rise from the dead and then doing it? Yeah, because... Who is the only one that could prophesy? God. Who's the only one that can bring life from the dead? God. And we have scriptures that say that is a miracle that Satan cannot. Satan cannot bring back from the dead. Only God can. Now, we do have ideas that maybe the Antichrist may be someone who appears to have died and resurrected. But in the sense of being dead. Okay, So... When we think about this, what a miracle is not, okay? The first thing we're going to talk about is providence. This again, what we want to do is, especially when we're presenting a case, we want to present the best case that we have. Because if we present something that is borderline, then they take that borderline case, they disprove it, and it makes it seem like everything else is disproven. 
So does that follow? Are you guys following that? So if I want to say that a miracle is, and, and I agree with Dave, that birth, what happens in birth is an amazing thing. But if we use that as a miracle, the person will be able to come back and says, well, this is why it happens. This is why it happens. These are all natural occurrences that happen naturally. And so what happens is then when we call other things, oh, these Christians call this miracle or that miracle. I've also heard it, and he uses the example in the book, fog on Normandy on the day of the invasion. Was it a good thing? Yes. Could God have been involved? Yes. Do we know for sure God was involved? No, because fog happens naturally on the coast. So, so what we're doing is we are making it so the guidelines are very specific so that we can argue, okay, from these. So that's what I would call providence. Is God involved? Was God involved with that? Probably. But we can't wheedle him out, okay? Again, if the car stopped in midair and your brother could climb out, and we could say most definitively <laughs> that, that something like that happened. Um, again, with these kind of things, providence, God is working at all times. He is accomplishing his will. You will not thwart his plan. He works through humans to do that. Poor God. <laughs> to work through us, but he accomplishes those things. But again, we can't definitively say, that's why I think you also have to be careful, and to give you a modern day example, when we've had certain religious leaders say that certain diseases are a judgment of God on. Now, are there biblical precedents where Paul talks about that there are certain things that are visited on people? Um, <laughs> that are visited on people because of their iniquity. But anyways, we're going to complete uh, without PowerPoint. So hopefully you guys are okay with that. Uh, so satanic signs. So basically we know through scripture, and especially if we believe that there is a material and an immaterial realm, there's a possibility of other beings that were created that have limited but not infinite power. So then we can see that, as, as Paul tells us as Christians, that angel, Lucifer, can be an angel of light. Mm -hmm. So then that's why we need to look at all these characteristics. We think of John saying, test the spirits, whether or not they are from God. Basically, did Christ come in the flesh uh, was one of the things. He was dealing with Gnostics at that time, which believed the body was evil and God wouldn't inhabit. But another case, another story. So, but we would ask them questions about Christ, you know. Uh, and so we need to be able to question the spirits. We need to know, and even the author of Hebrews tells us that his messengers, angels, can be flames. They can be winds. They don't have to take the form of people or anything of that nature. So certain supernatural events, there's an interesting correlation between demonic possession and uh, alien abduction. There's been some great stuff written, uh, some great uh, uh, or, or data and research that's been done. But again, those three things. Is it something that only God can do? Is it something that um, has a purpose? And is that purpose a good purpose, both biblically, you know, and in some cases civilly? Is that all making sense? So satanic signs, okay? Uh, then there's psychosomatic. I had never heard about this until I started doing research in psychosomatic illnesses, false pregnancies where people are so convinced that they're pregnant that their body actually starts reacting and they actually start producing abnormal belly size. Their, their body goes through a lot of those changes that happens during pregnancy, okay? Now, that's really weird, okay? But it's not a miracle. Also, another thing really quick with satanic signs, and this reminds me, if you want to read a book 
always disturbs my wife. It's called The Beautiful Side of Evil. It's written by a woman by the name of Joanna Michelson. And she, ever since she was young, saw ghosts. And she even, for a while, her spirit guide was Jesus. But she actually went and studied under a kind of, I would say, a shamanistic healer in Mexico called Pachita. I mean, Harvard professors had gone down to look at this lady. And, but one of the things they found out when they would do research is these miracles or supposed healings were never permanent. There were temporary, there were other problems. So when it comes to satanic signs, and I think the biggest thing, especially from a biblical standpoint, is whether or not it points to Christ. Yeah. Uh, exorcism? Yeah. I believe that, yeah, because of demon possession, I do believe mm -hmm. exorcisms are real things. Um, uh, the guy uh, who wrote the commentary for Concordia on Revelation, he's since passed. Uh, he, has a, he had a personal letter from Churchill. He first started in England as one of his churches. But the movie, The Exorcist, was actually based on a boy. And that boy was a Lutheran uh, kid. And uh, he was actually part of uh, the process of the um, uh, exorcism. Mm -hmm. And he talks about it uh, in his Revelation commentary. Uh, but this boy would levitate. Uh, this boy, I mean, it, it was weird. And so he was in that process. Um, that, and obviously, things were happening that were outside of normal nature. So if we want to call it supernatural, but they were demonic. But again, using these three principles, you could tell that it was not of God. Uh, and thus, an exorcism was needed. And so, yeah, uh, one was performed. Um, magic, obviously, sleight of hand, misleading of the mind. These are not miracles. Now, there are some magicians out there. Uh, Chris Angel is one of them that... Man, I'm thinking a little Faustian uh, kind of on his edge that because uh, can there be some demonic activity with some of these magicians? Very much so. Yeah, they seem like they're doing more and more. Yeah. Possible. Yeah. And, and so last thing, uh, anomalies. Uh, the, he gives the example in the book of bumblebees that they looked according, they couldn't quite understand how a bumblebee with the size of its wing and its body mass could actually fly. Uh, but with science, they discovered that they had basically just the amount of energy, similar to a hummingbird, that could use that and cause it to fly. So there's certain things that we don't quite understand. And if it's not understood, we don't want to necessarily call them a miracle. Again, we need those three attributes. We need, it is truly something that un- it could not happen on its own. As Dave said that, you know, things left to their own, nature just could not produce it. Or, or and that there's purpose behind it. There's a definitive purpose of why this took place. And is there a moral? And usually the pointing to God, the, the glorifying of God in that. So why don't more miracles happen today? And I think people have this misunderstanding. Now, he goes into some numbers. He also says those numbers are days because multiple things happened where Jesus healed many on one day and this, that, and the other. He talks about 250 miracles that are done in the Bible. Okay? He then talks about three periods, really where you have a huge uh, uh, outpouring of miracles. Formation of the Israelite nation under Moses you have then the ministries of Elijah and Elisha uh, during the really apostate times of the two kingdoms. Then you have Jesus and his apostles. And so basically he goes on to argue, and I think it's a good argument, that these are points in time where God is manifesting so that people would know who his messengers were. And if we really think about it, if we take 250 miracles over the course of... You know, just going back to Moses, 250 years over the course of 3,500 years, yeah, they're pretty sparse. <laughs> or at least recorded ones are what we have recorded. And even sometimes we have the telescoping or the, or the um, crunching together of like the book of Acts. We don't realize years have taken place 
between certain miracles because it's the next chapter we think, oh, day two. You know, this miracle happened when these are very elongated time. There's hundreds of years. We can actually see now we don't have anything recorded. Could there have been miracles? Yes, there could have. But for 400 years from the time of Malachi to the time of John the Baptist, there's no prophetic word. 400 years. It seems like God is pretty silent. We have... We have then the Greek Empire, that came, or the Persian Empire, then the Greek Empire, then the Roman Empire. Then we had everything that was happening with uh, Maccabees, and, and he was silent. So, and there is, like I said, Craig Keener. He just had a new one released called Miracles Today, which is a follow-up to his two-volume set called Miracles. It's phenomenal. There's other great books out there. I would not read the one. I, I usually don't do this, but I would not read the one by Eric Metaxas. I read it the first time it came out and it really kind of disturbed me because he took pot shots at young earth creationists. And I don't mind disagreement, but within the community of faith, um, you know, they always get mad. Obviously they should if we make pot shots at them. Uh, and he just goes in and uses young earth creationists as an example when I thought it was really inappropriate. It really made me mad. And I've, I knew that he disagreed with me. I didn't have a problem. Uh, but then he really, I think, uh, inappropriately used that. So a lot of the other books I would highly recommend. So, um, so also we don't have, if miracles are signs from God to confirm a message from God, as the author of Hebrews says, in various times and in sundry ways, God has spoken to his people through his prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken through his son. And his son is gone. And his son, in the sense of earthly, but his apostles, you know, and many of the prophecies in the end of John where he says, the spirit will bring to your mind everything that I have taught you. That's not for us. That was for his apostles. And they wrote down, they recorded, there's no need for any other revelation. Now, does that mean God does not perform miracles? No, I am not a cessationalist. I do not believe that God doesn't perform miracles. Um, but I think it's very specific. Uh, I'll give you one example um, that, that I believe uh, many missionary stories you can, you can read about uh, that I think God used. Uh, one of them is recounted where this basically this tribe said that he was uh, going to kill uh, this missionary and his family if they didn't leave. They decided not to leave. They trusted in God. Uh, the next day came and they did not die. And the chief came and wanted to ask them about their faith. And basically he said, well, wh what gave your change? He said, we came to kill you. But the army that was around your yeah. thing, well, there's no way we could take them. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. But he says there was no way that we could take them. Obviously, it had to be an angelic host. Uh, it had to be sent, you know. And the good result was now they wanted to know who this person was. So, so those are kind of things. Now, you could technically say the power of God was not involved. So really, I mean, we still just have to be careful, if you see what I'm saying, uh, in regards to that. Okay? We need to avoid blanket statements. Okay? Uh, as we've seen some of these do. Okay, so next question is, has God used miracles to distinguish one of these theistic religions? So really, as we go forward, that's what we're going to go into. We're now going to look at specifics of revelation, Christian revelation in particular, but I will bring in aspects of other revelations, uh, and we're going to see which one fits this bridge that takes us from natural revelation to special revelation, this miracle confirming a messenger of God, where does it point? And that's what we're going to go into. Okay. Now, the last thing we're going to go over tonight, and really it was really quick, is we go, uh, we're in part two 
uh, finding the flaws in tactics. And chapter 11 is practical suicide. Chapter 10 was formal suicide. Uh, remember, formal suicide is what the authors of I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist called the roadrunner tactic. When, you, when a, a statement is incoherent, it's necessarily false. If it violates the law of non-contradiction, some of the examples that we gave are there is no truth. Does the statement live up to its own standard? Well, that is a claim to truth, saying there is no truth. They contradict, it's necessarily false. I can't speak a word in English, or even I can't write a word in English, or you know, whatever you may be. Obviously, it's in English, so it contradicts. That is what he calls formal suicide, okay? What we're getting now in is practical suicide. Now, practical suicide is it's not incoherent as a, as a um, phrase, it's not internally inconsistent. It doesn't break down necessarily on its own, but it commits suicide as soon as you act upon it. As soon as you speak it, as soon as you uh, try to promote it, then it becomes contradictory because you are claiming one thing and then denying it with your statement. I'll give you an example he gives in the book. You should never tell people they're wrong. Well, technically, does it break down? You should never tell people they're wrong. Well, maybe that person never will. But as soon as you say it, what is the whole purpose? You're telling them that they're wrong. And so now it becomes incoherent when you put the statement and the act together. They contradict and they break down. Are you following me? Okay, so that is where it commits practical suicide because it's unlivable. Don't push your morality on me. Um, are you pushing your morality on me telling me not to do something? <laughs> or don't you try to legislate morality? What else do you legislate? I know, that's exactly right. <laughs> um, as soon as you say something like that, you are contradicting your own statement. So think about formal suicide when a statement in and of itself contradicts. That is formal suicide. Can't speak a word of English. Uh, there is no such thing as truth. You know, those kind of statements. But now we have other statements that in and of themselves as a proposition aren't self-contradictory. They don't fail their own standard. But once they're put into action, you couple that together and it, it commits suicide. Does that make sense? So he gives, um, th this one is more, I mean, a lot of these are more philosophical in nature and sometimes they're hard to wrap your minds around. What I would say in regards to these is repetition is great and you can actually go out. Uh, I've got, if anybody wants it, and you can buy it online too. Tactics has a uh, um, study guide and a workbook that'll do all of this. Uh, so we won't get into it in class, but it'll give you more repetition on, on some of these new concepts. I don't remember that you mentioned it in this class, but uh, I Don't Have Enough Faith also has a workbook. Yes, yep. And I, I think we talked about it at the very beginning but I haven't since. It has a workbook. I actually could give you tests on every chapter too. I've got tests, but wow. you don't look like you're into tests. <laughs> and I'm not into grading tests. <laughs> um, so uh, when we look at this, we could actually say that what happens is this fails. In, in one of my worldview classes, I used to teach nine tests for truth. And one of them is called the pragmatic test of truth. Now, the pragmatic test for truth you can't use usually on its own. It's when things aren't, uh, that don't work out in reality. And so this is really what he is using here, is once you bring it into reality, out of your little noggin into reality, it's unlivable, it's untenable. Uh, someone who, another form of practical suicide that he talks about is every moral relativist. Every moral relativist will come to you and say, there is no right or wrong. But as soon as you do something to them that they don't like, 
Foul? Well, if there is no right or wrong, why'd you call foul? You're contradicting your statements. It's unlivable because we are in a moral world. It, it's just the way it is. And anytime you violate reality, you have consequences. There was a gentleman I remember. He said, uh, you know, I, I talk and I discuss a lot with people who are much more intelligent than me, much more read than me. The only problem is I have reality on my side and they don't. He, he was very practical about it. They have to come up with convoluted explanations. I just come forth with how reality is. Um, and, but it's interesting. So um, one thing, we talked about it's wrong for people to say. The one thing I, I think is interesting, because this is an apologetics class, and arguing is contrary to scripture. Many people, we actually, uh, we had a gentleman leave one of our apologetics classes and said that he could not come back because uh, he did not believe it was legitimate to argue people into the kingdom. He only used the Bible. We tried to show him that Paul argued, but it's interesting because he committed practical suicide. Now, it wouldn't have been appropriate to bring it up at that time. It would have seemed kind of like pouring salt on the wound or something. Uh, we could have used Columbo number three to ask questions, but what do they do? I don't believe that arguing is biblical because of point one, point two, and point three. What are they doing? They're arguing. <laughs> it's self-destructive. They're saying arguing is not valid, yet they're proving their point by arguing. So it's self-destructive. It's practical suicide. So maybe in that course, what I could have said is, you know, this kind of strikes me as weird, and I just want to make sure I'm clear on this, but are you arguing for your point? I mean, it could be as simple as that. What is he going to say? Yes. Well, he may reflect a second and go, well, I am. So is that a valid form of argument against me? Or should you just be telling me scripture? I just don't think people realize sometimes. So this is a good way. Now, again, you're not going to look at him and go, dude, don't you know? That's practical suicide, you idiot. <laughs> no, no. You, you, you work with it and you say, hey, let's make sure we're getting this right. You're, you're telling me, you know, or he says in the book as well, he says, you know, the guy came up on his radio show and he said, he called into his public radio show and said, you should not call out public or call out Christian leaders in public venues. And he's like, well, why are you calling me out on a public venue right now? <laughs> uh, you know, um, why are you do doing that? I just don't think people think that way. They're, it, it's an emotional response. And then the thoughts come after. I think we're all like that. I don't know how many times I've stuck my foot in my mouth um, and thought, dude, I just reacted totally emotionally. And what I said was the dumbest thing I could have said. And I've hurt people. And it's not. And, and then you end up arguing that you're right and dig even a deeper hole. We're so good at that. <laughs> um, so, um, and the last thing I want to. You know, um, so moral relativism always pretty much commits practical suicide. Uh, and when people tell us that we should not force our morality on other people, ask them, why not? And he really uses that um, because if there is no right or wrong, because if you say why not, they're probably not going to come out with the idea to say it's wrong because they've just done it. And if they're quick on their feet, they're going to know that they're backed up against a wall. Okay. So we need to do that. So when we're thinking through these, so these are going to be quicker chapters. He gives a couple of examples. Uh, one of them was his trip to the Soviet Union. Another one was evangelizing Jews. We get this a lot of the times with don't push your religion on me from other religious groups. And the, the, 
thing that he was talking about with the Jews is the Southern Baptist Convention had decided that they were going to pray for a certain period of time and have people, if you knew Jewish, belie or Jewish uh, people, to talk to them about Jesus and try to convert. Well, rabbis and everything were upset and said, you should only convert those who don't have a religion. And you're really, so are you pushing your religious motivation on me, telling me not to abide by my religious motivation? Again, it's practical suicide. Bring that out, help them see that they're doing the very thing that they say you can't do. Okay? Uh, and, you know. So, uh, remember it may take a bit of self-realization on their part to get what you're saying. Most people don't think like this anymore unfortunately. Give them a time and always. I think that's why he starts the book Tactics with Columbo, uh, the three Columbos and, and that. Use questions. When you tell someone they're wrong, you get defensive. When somebody through questioning reveals to themselves that they're maybe on the wrong track, it's much better. And we should use those. Um, avoid blanket statements. Be specific, specific and definitive with details. Okay? It's wrong to say people are wrong. Okay? That's one of those practical suicides. But what if you say it is wrong to say people are wrong without evidence? You add a little detail that makes it more specific and you're not saying that it's wrong to call people out. It's just wrong to call people out if you have no reason why they're wrong or you don't have any details or any evidence against it. Okay? Or it's wrong to judge. We hear this all the time. Well, it's wrong to judge maybe without consideration or without understanding. You know, as you can see, so if you're going to make statements like that, broad blanket statements usually lead you down ways you don't necessarily want to go. You claim too much and it's going to break down somewhere. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. So for next week, don't, you know, if you want to keep your, um, uh, your syllabus, uh, when it comes to what you're reading scripturally, go ahead and do that. Next week, we will go over, uh, chapter, um, nine, uh, which is early testimony of Jesus in I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. We will go over chapter 12 of tactics. Okay. And then just read through your scripture and then we'll just go through that for next week. Hey, look at that. I finished like 12 minutes early. And one of the things they te teach you is, uh, uh, is it, I can't remember the technical title, like reflective listening. They said that most communication falters in a understanding of very simple statements. So a lot of the times when you get into these arguments or discussions, it is, and maybe rephrase it the way you're understanding it so that you can say, so what I hear you saying is that this is, and a good example of that <coughs> is his argument in tactics when he's talking, when he's going from Romania to Moldavia and they get stopped and they're taking Bibles over. And he asks some of those questions. So let me get this right. You say that there's religious liberty, but there's, but, uh, we can't bring Bibles in, right? It's propaganda. Well, you're saying that you print Bibles in Russia. Is that correct? Yes. So you're printing propaganda in your own country. Yes. <laughs> I mean, but it, it's, it's getting that clarification because you're like, you know, you're just really kind of contradicting yourself. Um, but I found out with those experiments with my sister that most of the time what she said is not what I heard. You, you, it really was. And I'm finding this out with Lisa. Uh, a lot of the times her and I all have to say, honey, I'm not sure. Most of the time I don't act the way I should. But what I should say is, honey, I'm really kind of hurt right now because this is what I heard you just say. And most of the time when I say that to her, she says, no, nah, that's not what I meant. I'm frustrated because of this. Oh, yeah. I'm frustrated because this, that, and the other, and you just happened to be the first thing I responded to. Okay, I feel better. 
but, but it really is a good tactic uh, to use because miscommunication, because words mean something to us. Give me an example when it comes to religion. You talk to a good Mormon, they use the exact same words, but their words have different meanings. Grace is God giving you what you don't deserve after doing everything you can. So there's a law element to it. Uh, Jesus is the spiritual brother of Lucifer that is not eternal, not part of the Trinity, but he's still called Jesus. So a lot of the times, and especially when you talk with different religious groups, uh, it's good. So let me get this straight. What do you mean by grace? What is grace? Is that totally undeserved favor from God? Well, no. You know. So uh, it, it's a great tactic. So I think it is in uh, developing that too. Because you're touching, and, and I think a lot of the times, just a miscommunication. A lot of times you see people agreeing, but not realizing they're agreeing and they're arguing. You know? So, no, very good point, Dean. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you all for coming. Why don't we close with a quick prayer? And then uh, everyone can be on their way. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much uh, for those who have gone before. We thank you for those who have developed this material, these books, that have really gone through these ideas as we stand on giants that have just gone throughout the centuries. Lord, we thank you that we have the availability of that. Lord, we pray that you would give your church uh, the hope and the strength, Lord, to be the shining light as, as things seem to get darker and darker. I pray for everybody here today. Lord, I pray that you would just strengthen their faith, that you would encourage them, that Lord, that even as hidden as you seem sometimes, that Lord, you would just help us to trust in you unequivocally. So now, Lord, I just pray that you would be with us as we go about our daily work this week and that you would just bless us. Lord, give us opportunities uh, to use what we've learned and to, to help somebody to see who you are. So, Lord, we thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.